founder and CEO of Verta AI, presenting on model versioning, why, when, and how. Manasi started Verta AI based on her work at MIT CSAIL on systems for software to streamline the, the process of data science and machine learning. Previously, she was a PhD student in the database group at MIT. She worked on systems for analysis of large-scale data, specifically on making machine learning and visual analysis faster, interactive, and more efficient. She is the recipient of the Facebook PhD Fellowship and Google Anita Borg Fellowship. Please welcome Manasi. Thank you. That makes me sound very academic, but this will not be academic. Um, but I'll try to piece it together and kind of tie it back to the work that we did at MIT. So I'm Manasi, and I will not go over that again. My background is systems for large-scale data analytics as well as applied ML. So I used to be part of the feed ranking group at Twitter, built deep learning models there to make sure that we could show more relevant content. And a lot of this talk is based on the system called ModelDB that I built. It's open source, you can try it out. And its purpose was to manage machine learning models. And in this talk, I'm gonna be weaving in what we learned in the first version of ModelDB, what we learned about model management versus model versioning versus metadata, and how they all come together. And also show you a demo of how we see the space so that you guys, as you're building your own systems or you're looking around, uh, you have one sort of reference implementation that you could come back to. A bit about Verda. Uh, we are a smallish company uh, in Palo Alto, and all of us come from similar applied ML slash systems backgrounds. We used to work at NVIDIA, sort of AV, uh, Twitter, Google, and so on. So our view is very much informed by putting models in production, and that will also kind of make sense when I talk about some of the design trade-offs that we made. All right, so the thesis here is that productionizing AI and ML is hard. And this is evident both from research done by um, McKinsey and consulting firms, as well as what we've seen helping teams deploy models. So usually most projects don't make it to production or it takes too long between six to 12 months, sometimes nine to 12 months to actually put a model into production. And if you look at the agenda today, it's like overcoming the barriers for deep learning in production. Machine learning models in production, what do you do after you've trained your model? Model as a service for decision making. And then operationalizing machine learning. Clearly at this point, we know how to build models, which is good. Um, we were not at that point earlier. But now we are, and now we are tasked with justifying, in some cases, why the data science teams are staffed as they are, and where our resources are going. So there, we think about why are ML projects not succeeding at the rate that we hope they would. And what we found was there were four reasons to do this, um, reasons for this, sorry. First one is ad hoc model development. So if you have built models yourselves, you'll know that it's the wild west out there. You're trying something, you're changing your features, you're changing your hyperparameters, maybe your data set changes underneath you, feature distribution changes. So there's a lot of iteration. That's the name of the game. Even harder is sharing data science knowledge. So while we are building models at these large companies, um, we used to spend several months recreating models that someone else had built because those people were no longer at the company and therefore there was no way to keep track of what they had done before. You can't imagine doing that with code. That's why we invented Git and GitHub. So the third one is model deployment which is how do I take this model that works at my laptop and put it into a production setting, maybe a mobile app is gonna use it, maybe a web app is gonna use it, or a Salesforce. And finally, models are living creatures, so to speak. Uh, their performance can decay over time. For example, the Ch Tay chatbot from Microsoft started off as a really great polite chatbot. A few days on Twitter, it's abusive and racist. I really hope that our models don't behave that way. But that just goes to show Microsoft has the best engineers, right? We still don't understand the space as well as we would hope. So we built a platform at Verda, which I'm not really gonna talk about today, but I'm gonna use this to make a point. Um, we built our platform on four pillars, as we call them. Versioning, collaboration, deployment, and monitoring, to line them up with the challenges that I mentioned before. But we st started finding something really interesting. 
Um, for the projects that we were succeeding with, um, we found that most of those teams had a good versioning system. So they had a process around how to build their models. They were also keeping track of where the model came from, who built it, um, what, was it what were its metrics, and so on. And what we realized was once you have versioning down, everything downstream becomes way easier. So once you have versioning, similar to Git again, Git and GitHub. Sharing your models is way easier. Um, if someone leaves your team, you can go back and see what their work was and see where you can pick up. Once you have a Git-like system, deploying, for folks fam familiar with CI CD, that's Jenkins. We've done this before. And finally, if you know what models are running and if you have a what we call API spec for them, you can actually do monitoring in a fairly effective way as we did for APM, like New Relic, AppDynamics, um, that whole space. So that's why today my talk is about model versioning only, uh, why you should be doing it, when, and how. All right, why must I do this? I've been doing this for ages. I never versioned my models. What's so special now? The quick answer is that we're now deploying models into production. Someone's actually using the model. We're not just writing papers. So it actually matters what version is deployed, whether it's doing well or not. Here's a quick table on how many models are built per project. And this is from Kaggle. These are 10 competitions. We looked at the top scorers. And here are the number of submissions that they made. So on average, um, to make a good submission, we're talking north of 100 models that someone tried. And these are some of their best models. Hyperparameter sweeps aren't even there. So some total is we're building many hundreds of these models. At the same time, the state of the art for tracking or versioning these models is as follows. That's actually mine. Um, you have folders. <laughs> folders that say, final, final, my best model, <laughs> do not delete. It's great. <laughs> um, this one's even a little bit more troubling because these are comments in code in a Jupyter notebook. Now, if a software engineer ever had to version in this manner, they would quit because like, you, make, you change your stuff a lot. Uh, this is an iterative process and you cannot keep track of every version that you're making. And finally, I asked a friend who works on health AI to tell me how they share their models. Here's some messages from Slack that she shared with me. She says, does anyone know if Blah ever updated her notebook to fix the issue for dependencies or something like that? I think apart from that, we're close to deploying, right? Wow, okay. And then someone else says, is that notebook merged in somewhere? Um, these things will power our self-driving cars. <laughs> you do not want to be in that car. Um, we will get there. I totally believe that we will get there and we'll have better processes. But this is just to illustrate why we need to be thinking hard about these problems and implementing these processes, I would say, from day zero. It's not a day 50 thing when you've figured everything out and you can bolt on versioning a lot later. And finally, we have to keep in mind that model building is a start. Once you actually deploy the model, someone's going to ask you what version is deployed again. If this model breaks, we need to roll back. So what was a previous stable version? And it can't be that, oh, I overwrote that particular directory path because you're not getting it back. S3 solves some of these issues, to be fair. Um, and I'll show you how we think about this as well. Similarly, while monitoring, um, it's our data drift. Things like explainability also become way easier once you have a central repository of all of the models, because then you can tie the explanations to a particular version of the model that was running. Okay, so in brief, you should care about versioning if you care about safety. Is your model actually working as expected? Speed of delivery, if you have Git, you can use CI, CD, and Jenkins. Insurance, if you're a team leader, you're really worried about what happens when someone churns. So someone leaves the team, I want to know how to preserve the knowledge um, the person had. And finally, I put this last because people have a hard time putting a number to it. Productivity, like your team is going to be way more effective if they can track all of the models that they're building and uh, make analyses on them. All right. So went over the why, um, now the how. Let's look at code versioning and compare that to model versioning, because the most frequent question I get is, well, I use isn't get enough for this. So let's see why, in what pieces is it enough and where does it fall behind? 
So the first code versioning systems were written in the 1970s for Unix, and we've seen, count them, five generations of these systems in the last 50 years. So the question is, one sort of meta question is why haven't we done this for models, but we went over that. But are models really that different? And I would start with, what is a model anyway? So I asked a bunch of uh, folks while I was in grad school, said, what is a model? Well, it's a function, some people said. Others were like, it's a set of assumptions about the world, which is fair. Um, it's, when you're deploying a model, it's too philosophical uh, for day to day. It can also be weights. It can be POJO, so like poor old Java objects. Um, for the database folks in the room, it is a data processing operator. I'm getting some data, I'm munging it, I'm turning it into something else. So at the end of the day, I would argue that a model is an artifact. It's not code, it's an artifact. It could be XML, PMML, your pickle file, uh, POJO, whatever is appropriate. And lots of people are like, well, I'm storing my particular model in S3 or in Git or Git LFS. And I would argue that that's insufficient. The reason is that when you deploy an app to the app store, um, the app store, the app is your artifact, but if you don't have the code that's actually building the app, then you're not versioning your app. You're just versioning the artifact that you produced. So in our case, a model version actually, along with that artifact, needs to track the code that you used. So whether it's a Jupyter notebook, a set of scripts, if it's a Git repo, you also need to track the data itself. Because if something changes underneath uh, the model, like and you have new data that comes in or annotations change, you want to know what version of data did you train your model on. You need to know the configuration. So what were the hyperparameters used? There's a lot of initialization that goes on in ML models, random seeds, initial state. You got to capture that if you want to reproduce the exact model. And finally, environment. Um, anyone who has grappled with Python dependency Paul will note that libraries need to have exact dependency pins, otherwise you're not gonna be able to reproduce it. Even hardware, now there are TPUs out there, and the models that you would get from training on a TPU versus CPU are gonna be different. So you would wanna know that. So our view, um, and when we started out with ModelDB, we were really focused on the configuration, because we thought, hey, that's efficient, right? I'm tracking my experiments. Turns out, not by far. So unless you have code, the model artifact, the source code, data, config, and environment, you're not really doing model versioning. It's some subset of it. You can call it metadata management. But to have true model versioning, these are all the four components that you're going to need. So the mental model that we have is there are multiple people working against a central model versioning server. They are pushing new models to it using the specification. They're also pulling things from it. So what you end up needing is kind of a hybrid of a Git-like versioning system and a database, because you also want to see, hey, what are the things that my colleague Steve built uh, that had metrics greater than a particular value? That's where having the database component turns out to be pretty essential. So before I switch to how we do this, um, the question is, when must I version my models, right? Can I bolt on, as I mentioned earlier? So let's go back to this diagram. Um, suppose you built a model, you want to deploy it, monitor it, retrain it. You, of course, got to start when you are building the model, because that's a time when you actually know all of the four things that you need. However, when you're ready to deploy, um, the things you need are model dependencies, and I would argue model API. And I'll talk about model API when I get, get to the demo part. Um, but you need the same thing that you stored before. You also store dependencies in your environment. So you have two out of three ready to go. When you go to monitoring, um, again, you need to know what model is running. You need a model API to tell you what its, supposed, what its supposed behavior is like and some sort of endpoint or batch job. And if you care about retraining your model, well, the thing you need is actually what you started with. Again, your code, your data, um, config and environment. So the reason I keep coming back to these is like these are hard learned lessons that you cannot take any of these away. Um, it will break down one or more components of your life cycle. All right. So let me jump over to a quick demo. Um, this is how we see the world. Uh, others have built similar systems. So the goal here is to show you 
how you can think about these problems as well. All right, so we were heavily inspired by Git because being software engineers, I think Git is fabulous and you can, it's very, very powerful. So I'm just gonna assume that most people here are using Python or can have a similar interface. So let's go up here. Can you guys see okay? Okay. All right, cool. So I'm loading a bunch of libraries. Um, I'm initializing something that we need to talk to our backend versioning servers. Let me get to the interesting bits. So data is a key part of our model version. And so we start creating data sets, we start creating data set versions. So here, my data set lives on S3 in a particular bucket. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a version of that data set. So this library is going and looking at S3, seeing if the checksums have changed, if new objects have showed up, and it's creating what we'll call a version of that data. The data munging is still in code, unless you're using something very specific, like maybe it's Airflow um, or other tools out there. And maybe you have a feature store, in which case uh, some of this data set versioning will tie into the feature store as opposed to tying into S3. But I get the data. Here I'm just doing a pretty simple um, tabular data modeling. I'm going to predict a last column, which is it's census data. Did someone make over 50K or under 50K? I'm going to build a logistic regression model, nothing terribly fancy so far. I'm giving it some hyperparameters, because we all do hyperparameter sweeps uh, to get the right model. And then I'm going to go off and train. So this is the piece where the versioning really becomes critical. And I'll point out the places where we spend extra effort in tracking all the things that we might want to, we might need later. All right. So here you can see that I'm locking the hyperparameters because if I think about it, even if I store this Jupyter notebook, I'm not going to know what specific set of hyperparameters created this particular model. So in addition to that notebook, I also need to store the exact configuration that I used. Similarly, maybe you care about what features you use. So this is, I would call metadata. Um, and you might also want to store some of the attributes. In our case, resources are a big deal. So what sort of CPU did this particular model need? What sort of memory did it need? And so on. I might store metrics, again, in the case of metadata, because I want to go back and see how my models did. And here we come to the code versioning, the data set versioning, as well as the requirements. So in this case, my requirements were just scikit-learn. You can give it a um, requirements.txt, which is more popular. This is just streamlined. Here, I'm logging the data set version. So remember that I created this version up here. And now I'm using a key value abstraction in order to associate that data version with this particular key train. And this also turns out to be crucial because a lot of times your raw data and your labels are living separately. And so you need to associate multiple data sets with your model itself. And then finally, we have the code. So I'm logging my Git SHA. I can log my Jupyter Notebook directly as well. So here you can see that it's logging various things. And I can now go and see them in a dashboard. So these are all of the models that I have built for this particular project. Um, as you can see, all of them have the hyperparameters. I have the requirements.txt because I'm going to have to recreate this model at some point. Um, I also can see, if I click through to this, I'll be able to see the data set that I used. And I'll show the data set view in just a sec. Um, I have code stored. It's a git commit, so it's telling me, here's your hash, uh, here's the repo, was the commit dirty, things that we would do in software engineering. Now, where this gets really interesting is two things. One is, I can actually compare my models. So this is telling me your C value changed. Mm, your C value might not have changed, something's funky there. Um, your max IDR did change, so that's 28, that's 15. The features changed. Now, I had age bucketized versus age, and the rest of the features were the same. I can also tell that my training data has changed. So that is hard to see. OK. So it's telling me that the key is still called train, but the different colors tell me that something is different. As I click through to it, I can see that I'm using the same data set, but I'm using two different versions of that data set. So what does that mean for us? 
It means that I was working with an S3 bucket. I'm looking at the size of the bucket. I'm also looking at the components of a, that bucket. And I see that a new file was added to it. And that might account for the changes that I'm seeing. Now, that's the diffing side. A lot of times, what you want to do is also just do meta-analyses on your data. So how did Lasso perform versus uh, correlated features if you're doing feature selection, ridge regression, baseline, and so on? Having a central place where you're storing all of your models enables you to do this. And this is also the place where Git would never be able to do this, because Git is not a database. It doesn't know the difference between a metric versus hyperparameter versus something more complicated, which is why the abstraction of Git plus database turns out to be um, immensely helpful. If I'm a manager, I really want to know if the accuracy that I'm being told is like the bottom of uh, that, the error bars or the top. So I want to know what my box plot looks like um, so that I can pick the right hyperparameters. You got to do hyperparameter sweeps and so on. So this is our view of how all of this data can be used. This can be way richer. And depending on your use case, some things might matter more than others. As a last bit, I'll leave you with this thing that we call model API that I alluded to earlier. So when you're not trying to deploy a model, all of this data that we're stored, stored so far is sufficient. You don't really need more. But once you want to deploy something, you want to know, you want to tell others how they can use your model. So in our case, we want to know what are the inputs that I should be sending to you and what are the outputs that they should be expecting. And once you have that, others can use your model very easily. And moreover, you can also start doing data drift detection. Since you have a uniform interface for your model, now I can tell you for any feature that I have, is my new data looking like my expected data? Did something change underneath? Do we need to do something different? So in addition to storing the code, uh, the data, config, and environment, I would urge you to think about also defining an API for each one of the models that you're building. All right, so happy to answer more questions about that offline. Um, but the key point there is we didn't do something terribly difficult. We defined the set of attributes that every model should have, and then we made sure that we were logging them as we were building the models. What we got out of it was that doing the first piece well allowed us to share that knowledge. There's a central repository. Anyone can go see what I worked on, maybe even download my model and continue iterating on it. It allows us to directly deploy. Um, and we have a boot downstairs. You're welcome to come by and check it out. And finally, we can do monitoring by defining this thing called the model API. And the API is very much created when you create the model. Um, a week later, you're not going to remember what all the features were or their distributions were. So I would urge you to think about how model versioning can be inserted into your pipeline from day one so that you can reap the benefits um, way downstream. So in summary, we think model versioning is fundamental to productionizing AI and ML models. It's not so simple as versioning code. Um, and once you version your models, all of the downstream activities are easier, robust, and fast. So that's all I got. Um, we're building various pieces of this platform at Verda. We have a boot downstairs, and happy to take questions, possibly offline, depending on time. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Yeah.